Hi, I'm author and medieval historian A.E. Chandler. When I lived in England, one thing I liked to do was visit graveyards. As a North American, you might have the idea in your head of a traditional wooden coffin and a headstone, and visiting Europe, you might expect to find some medieval headstones when you walk through the graveyards. But you don't. You see mostly stones from the 1800s and 1900s, and it's probably more likely you'll find stones from the 2000s than ones from the 1600s, which is about as far back as you'll see them going. Just like a burial with a coffin and a headstone are very expensive now, relative to the average person's income, they were even more expensive in the past. So just like there are people now who can't afford a coffin and a headstone burial when a family member passes away, it was common in the past for people not to be able to afford these things either. But a coffin and a headstone burial is just one of the ways to handle a body, and one that only became popular fairly recently. Today we're going to be talking about medieval burial practices. We'll be focusing on England in the post-conquest, pre-Black Death years, so around 1066 to 1348, and we'll be focusing mostly on the practices of average, everyday people and the material culture of their burials, meaning the physical elements of medieval burial practice. Even though we'll be focusing on the material culture, you can't take the religious aspect entirely out of medieval culture and practices. So I do want to make two important disclaimers before we get into our topic here. First, in this video, when I talk about the religious beliefs connected to burial, these are medieval religious beliefs and not necessarily what the Bible actually says. Today, Bibles are common and translated into as many languages as possible so that everyone can read about God for themselves. In the medieval period, books were scarce and expensive because they had to be copied by hand by a skilled scribe, and the Bible is an extremely long book, so the vast majority of people in the medieval period would never have seen a Bible. Even the parish priests who looked after the churches that served the local communities probably wouldn't have read the entire Bible. They might just have the Book of Psalms, and trying to tease out a comprehensive set of religious beliefs from a book of prayer poetry without knowing much about the other dozens and dozens of books of explicit theology in the Bible could definitely be problematic, even when they were doing their best. So I just want to be clear that we are talking about medieval beliefs and not necessarily biblical beliefs. The other disclaimer is that most of this video is based on an archaeology presentation I gave in England and not my original research. So if you're interested in learning more after watching, you can check out... C. Burgess's A Fond Thing Vainly Invented, an essay on purgatory and pious motive in late medieval England, which can be found in Parish, Church, and People, Local Studies in Lay Religion, 1350 to 1750. C. Daniel's Death and Burial in Medieval England, 1066 to 1530. E. Duffy's The Stripping of the Altars, Traditional Religion in England, circa 1400 to 1580. P. Binsky's Medieval Death, Ritual and Representation. And J. Finch's Commemoration in the Late Medieval Church, 1400 to 1500, in Church Monuments in Norfolk Before 1850, An Archaeology of Commemoration. So, with those disclaimers out of the way, here we go! High status burial practices are what most people tend to picture when they think of medieval burials. High status people in the medieval period were more likely to have elaborate burials, more likely to be buried indoors rather than outdoors, and more likely to have people generations later still looking after their burial sites despite not having a personal connection to them. All of this contributes to high status burials being better preserved, even though they were in the minority, giving this odd impression that, because this is what we can still see, this must have been the norm, when really it was only a very small number of people who had burials like this. In order to understand the material culture of medieval burials, 
we have to understand a bit about how people thought about burials and where the dead fit into the society of the living. Most people were buried in their parish community, meaning their local community where everyone was under the spiritual care of the same priest and the parish community wasn't just its currently living members, it also included its past members and its future members. People didn't think about their parish community exclusively in the present sense, but in the perspective of eternity. The parish church was the focal point of the community, where people met to worship, hold markets, and play sports, and the dead were not excluded. Today we expect our burial grounds to be separate, away from the living, a domain of the dead where we only visit when we're actively mourning. In the medieval period, the dead were buried in and around churches, right in the center of community activities. Burial grounds in the social consciousness weren't spooky or morbid, they were at the heart of communities. In urban communities, churches were green spaces to take walks in and unwind, like city parks today. Every time a family walked into church to worship and strengthen their relationship with God, they would be passing by the graves of relatives who were already in heaven with him. This is where we start to get into the material culture. Physical objects are one way of reminding people of this bond we've been talking about and of tying them together. Medieval people would sometimes convert spiritual values into material displays in order to bind together disparate groups in the community, in this case, the living and the dead. Examples of these kinds of objects could be reliquaries, stone effigies, stained glass windows, or a folding altarpiece with the patron and his wife painted into the religious scene displayed on it. These are fairly expensive options. Even people who could afford them uh, usually had to prioritize. For example, by having a brass plate with an inscription inside on the church's wall while not marking the actual grave. Reasoning that the indoor wall plate would last longer and be more meaningful. Less affluent families might save up and donate a candlestick or some other small object that could be used in the church to remind the community to pray for their dead loved one. A donation upon the death of a family member could have multiple functions. It could be a permanent witness to the community that they had lived in of their charity and piety. It could be a show for the neighbors of a family's status and wealth, or it could be that reminder prompting their neighbors to pray for them even after they were dead, keeping them included in the spiritual community when they were no longer physically present. If you walk through a community park today, you're probably going to see at least one bench with a plaque that says it was donated in the memory of a family's loved one. When someone died in the late medieval period, you could expect to see women preparing the body in the home before monks came to take it. Funerals were held on the church porch, at the south door where people would normally enter for mass. Church porches weren't just where your body would rest before you were buried. They were also where you got married and where people could go to sign important contracts with the parish priest acting as a witness. The church porch was part of a person's routine spiritual life, but also the setting of important events in their earthly life, and it seems fitting that this would also be the last place that their body would rest for their community to see them off. At funerals, meat, drink, shoes, and stockings would be distributed, mainly to the poor. Most people weren't buried in their secular clothes, but in only a shroud, and most burials at this time have no grave goods aside from a pin that was used to close the shroud. You only sometimes see a coffin, a brooch, maybe money or pottery. Some burials have been found with indulgences in them, uh, essentially paid for pardons from sin issued by a pope or anti-pope. And shells have been found in the graves of palmers, people who had gone on a holy pilgrimage. Some bodies were also buried with a headdress to indicate their social status. Souls in heaven were supposed to be naked and sexless, but medieval people also thought there would be some kind of hierarchy, and for them this was best shown by a headdress in life and in death. There's an assumption that Christian burials never contained grave goods, and while this was the trend, it definitely wasn't true for everyone. Grave goods don't necessarily 
mean that the person thinks they will need those things in their afterlife, though that can be the case. Grave goods can also be accidentally dropped in or sentimental. Some people are buried today with a favorite possession, maybe a medal that they won, and that doesn't mean that person believes they will be wearing that medal in their afterlife because they were buried with it. Another assumption is that unbaptized people, usually young children, weren't allowed to be buried in holy ground. However, depending on the time and place, there were medieval burials of unbaptized people in holy ground. In the medieval period, people tried to bury their loved ones with the feet pointing east, so that they would be able to see the second coming with Christ arriving from the east, which is also why most churches point in that direction. In England, they also tried to bury loved ones on the south side of their parish church. This was because more evil winds were supposed to come from the north, also why you won't typically see any doors that open on the north side of a medieval English church, like this one. Medieval grave sites could be chosen so that they were closer to a path through the churchyard or a road bordering it so that they could be seen and remembered by the community more readily. The initial rows of a medieval churchyard were usually straight and shoulder to shoulder, but later rows might appear more random and cut across two or more older burials below. When you walk past a medieval churchyard now, you can usually see how much higher the ground is than on the pavement, and this is due to centuries of burials building up the ground level. This goes back to the idea of the parish church being the meeting point for the community, past, present, and future, thousands upon thousands of people in this one physical space. Reusing the land was a necessary part of keeping the generations of the community together. Just like the living and the dead shared the same space, generations of the dead shared the same space. Rather than taking more and more land away from the living in the middle of important urban or village centers, seeing layers of graves cutting across one another over time suggests that grave markers were designed to be short term. Remember at the beginning of the video we mentioned that you don't really see stone grave markers from the medieval period. Options like a mound, a hearse cloth, or possibly just flowers were not only cost effective in a society where most people were subsistence farmers, but they also allowed this important reusing of the land so that it could continue to belong to all generations instead of to just one. Most graves would probably have been marked by a wooden cross. This cross would have lasted about a generation before rotting away, meaning that the family and friends of the person who died had been able to visit their actual grave site, but once everyone who knew them in life had joined them in death, the grave marker would go back into the earth as well. It's also a very environmentally friendly method of burial, with most people going to their graves with just a wooden cross, a shroud that allowed them to decompose naturally, and a pin. Parish burials were usually simple. Just as an example at the end here, I'd like to mention the partially surviving description we have of Robin Hood's burial from the medieval poem Robin Hood His Death. Robin tells Little John to bear him to yonder street and make a grave of gravel and grit. He asks for his sword to be set at his head, his arrows at his feet, his bow by his side, and mentions his met yard, probably a rod for measuring the distance to an archery target, before the manuscript cuts off. We don't know if the missing last section would have mentioned an above ground grave marker or what Robin wanted to be buried in, a shroud or his clothes. We can see that it's an atypical medieval burial though, because of the amount of grave goods he's requested for inclusion though this fits well with Robin Hood's status as an atypical figure in a piece of literature and his consciousness of his higher social status as a yeoman, which is characterized by the weapons he carries. If you're interested in more original history, you can check out my novel The Scarlet Forest, A Tale of Robin Hood, available at Amazon, Chapters, and all over. Or you can check out the other videos on this channel. Thanks for taking a walk with me through some medieval graveyards. Bye!